welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the May 12th edition of the Agricultural Market Situation and Outlook. This is a monthly program put on by um, NDSU Extension and in particular the uh, agribusiness section. Um, so as we move forward, uh, we're going to go through the presentations. Uh, we ask that you kindly use either the chat or the Q&A function to ask any questions. We're gonna try and save those questions towards the very end and be able to answer them at that point after we've gone through all of the, the, um, the, the sessions or all of the different sections. Um, the other thing is that if you have any questions uh, later on, don't hesitate to reach out to us and contact us. We are also recording this. So for, uh, for reference, if you do wanna go back and, and see some of the previous recordings, you can certainly do that. So uh, Dr. Brian Parment is not gonna be with us today. Uh, so I'll begin the, the session and talk a little bit about the implications from the May uh, WASDE report, the one we got out uh, just uh, about two hours ago. Um, this is my contact information. So I'm Fran Olson, I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, some interesting things. Um, the May report is the first report that USDA uh, makes forecasts for the new marketing year. So this is the first month we have indications and information on, on the forecast for the 2022-23 marketing year, basically the, the crop that we're now starting to plant. Uh, we got an update from the old crop numbers from the last marketing year, 21-22, which I'll go through in a minute. But the I think a lot of the interest and, and a lot of the questions are revolving around what is USDA projecting and expecting for 2022 marketing year. So let's begin with a recap, a little bit of any changes and adjustments made for the old crop numbers. Um, so I'm gonna go through several slides they are laid out basically the same way. Um, I've tried to compare what the pre-report industry estimates were. This is a survey of, of industry forecasting firms or individuals that do projections of uh, independent projections, say, what do you ex anticipate to see coming out of the USDA report? So uh, large news agencies will, will poll or survey these folks, and then they have an, an average trade estimate, which is listed and highlighted in blue at the very top of this table. Um, we have the highest trade estimate, the lowest trade estimate. The highlighted in black towards the bottom is last month's information. So this is the forecast that USDA had last month versus the information we got today, which is highlighted in red on the very bottom. So for, for reference point, um, usually what we recommend is that you compare the blue number with the top row versus the red numbers on the bottom. Uh, because in, in many cases, there the trade is expecting to see some changes. The question is, is USDA going to follow through with the numbers that are as, as large, uh, either an increase or decrease as expected? So I just want to quickly go through. This is, again, from the old crop numbers. This is from the crop that's still in the bin. Um, this is a forecast of the ending stocks, the amount of grain we expect to have in the, in su the supply chain just before harvest. So when we start comparing the numbers, all wheat, there was a, a slight reduction. So we came up with some lower wheat numbers, lower wheat ending stocks numbers than had first been expected. And that is one of the reasons we're getting some of the rally in the wheat market today. That's only a portion of it. I'll, I'll talk about more details in a moment. But that also kicked us off. So our old, old crop expectations are a little bit smaller than we had expected. Um, for the corn numbers, you, uh, I think the private estimates were looking for a slight decrease. They were expecting something, uh, I think, a little bit higher exports numbers. When you compare this month versus last month, it's essentially unchanged. So USDA didn't make any changes in the old crop corn balance sheet. For soybeans, um, there was some reductions. And, and again, that reduction that we saw uh, relative to what the, from relative to last month, so the black line versus the, the, the red one, we were expecting to see a reduction. The reduction wasn't quite as large as what the trade is expecting. So if you compare the blue number to the red number, um, there was a reduction, but not quite as large as what the trade had expected. And most of those changes came in the form of, of some change or shifting in, in export numbers. Now, as we look forward, so that's kind of a recap very quickly of old crop now, the, um, again, most of the interest is in the new crop numbers. So May is also one of the first months we get an update for the production forecast for winter wheat by class or by, by category. So again, the blue line on top is what the trade is expecting to see. The red line on the bottom 
is is what we uh, what we actually received or what we were what we got in the report. Um, we did have again as a reference point numbers from last year. So this would be for 2022 wheat production relative to the black line, which is 2021 wheat production. So if we look at all wheat, uh, the forecast for all wheat production was actually significantly lower than what the trade was expecting. And again, this is also part of the reason compiled on top of lower ending stocks from last year that we're starting to see uh, an increase or rally in the wheat market today. Um, most of that reduction, if you notice the, the hard red winter wheat column, which is a third column over, let me use my, my arrow here. If we're looking at this column for hard red winter wheat, most of the reduction in those numbers came from that hard red winter wheat category. And, and a significant portion of that was because of lower forecasted uh, uh, yields and total production out of Kansas and Oklahoma. So again, when you look at what the trade was expecting versus what we actually got from the USDA forecasts, uh, pretty significant change relative to where we had been before. Now, the soft red winter wheat numbers, which would be more of the uh, Missouri, Southern Illinois, Ohio kind of winter wheat. We also have some uh, soft red winter wheat in Michigan that's produced. Very, very similar to what the trade was expecting, um, a little bit lower than last year, but well within the trade range. For white wheat, now again, white wheat, uh, the winter portion of white wheat is also both soft white as well as hard white, white winter wheat. Those numbers actually came up a little higher than expected, uh, but the white wheat market is actually a very specialized area and we don't have a futures market for it. So when we look at what happens in the futures market today for hard red winter wheat, uh, soft red winter wheat, as well as spring wheat, because there's some spillover effects. Uh, we're looking at a response to lower carryover stocks from last year, as well as now lower than, than expected production numbers. Shifting into corn and soybeans. Again, we're looking forward into the 2022 year production year. Um, this is the first time that USDA is putting some projections together for both production and consumption for 2022. I wanna be a little bit cautious because they are going to use for the planted acreage numbers as well as harvested acreage, they're going to use information from that March 31 planting intentions report. So that March report for planted acreage, they make an adjustment for harvested acreage based on kind of a historical relationships. So the really, I, I think the biggest wild card in, in the equation was what is USDA going to use for a yield forecast or a yield projection? So if we compare uh, not only corn, but also soybeans then between what the trade was expecting highlighted in blue versus what the red number is highlighted in uh, on the very bottom, uh, we noticed that USDA did come out with a, a, a bit lower uh, national average corn yield than expected. So if you look at the trade estimate, about 180 um, bushels per acre a national average is the trend line yield. Um, so if you look back the last 30 years and you do a trend line, it comes out to be at about 180 80 bushels per acre. Um, USDA did lower that a bit. And I think part of that is because of the slow planting progress, um, as well as, 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 as not only delayed planting up here in the Northern Plains, but also into the Corn Belt. When we look at soybeans, uh, again, the, the yield forecast or projections that, that the trade came out with versus what the initial USDA uh, forecast is very, very similar. Again, that 51.5 uh, um, bushels per acre is about a trend line yield. So when you do the math on plant uh, harvested acreage and you plug in these yield numbers, you come up with those forecasted total production. So on corn, total production number is actually a bit lower than what the trade is expecting. Again, the reason that we had a little bit of a lift in the corn market after the report came out. Um, on the soybean side, I would consider that relatively neutral. It's, it's very close to the trade estimate and well within the trade range. So when we put all of this together, that's the production side, but we also look at the consumption side. And when you take the production less the consumption, here's the, the at least initial forecast for ending stocks. Again, the amount of grain we're going to have left in, in the supply chain just before harvest now of 2023. So we're looking quite a ways into the future. Um, so there's going to be, especially uh, for both production and the consumption, there's going to be some, some uh, I, I guess, room for adjustment as we go through the rest of the growing season. So if we look at what the trade is expecting and the top row in blue versus what they actually came out in the report on the very red on the very bottom, we do see that wheat ending stocks is, are expected to be up a little bit. 
from what the trade was expecting. Now, again, this is relative to what we expected to see. It was a little bit higher than what we were expecting. The majority of that was because USDA did cut the, or reduce their forecast for wheat exports. And again, I think that part of that is because of the higher prices we see in today's marketplace. Uh, but again, we'll have to wait to see how the export pace for wheat continues throughout the rest of the growing season. For corn, ending stocks numbers, again, very, very close, in my opinion, uh, what the trade is expecting versus what we actually saw. Uh, again, just a small amount, amount of difference, rounding error, in my opinion, of well within the trading range. When we looked at the same thing for soybeans, the average trade estimate came out very, very close to what uh, the, the, the trade was expecting. Now, I want to go back half a step. Remember, we had corn where the national average corn yield was below what the trade was expecting, but our ending stocks ended up to be very similar, which implies or suggests that there was some kind of reduction then in the forecast for consumption. And to me, this is a little bit of a surprise. USDA did reduce their forecast for feed consumption, feed and residual, when we compare the, the number they forecasted for this new crop year versus what they were forecasting for the old crop 2021, there was, in my opinion, a pretty large reduction. So we'll, again, we'll wait, wait to see as we move through time if USDA starts adjusting that. But uh, it, I, I guess that was a bit, bit of a surprise as I went through the numbers. Um, just a really quick to update on South American production. Again, now this will be for the old crop numbers. This is for the harvest in Brazil and Argentina that's basically completed. Uh, I think the only number that's really yet to be determined is the corn number for Brazil, because Brazil has both a first crop and a separate second crop corn. Um, the second crop corn harvest has not been completed yet. There are some very dry conditions now showing up in, in central and southern Brazil, which will have an impact on corn production, on corn yield and yield forecasts. Uh, so far, it, based on when you compare it again, the red line on the very bottom versus the number we had last month, there was really essentially no change in the Brazilian corn forecast. I do think the trade is expecting to see a slight reduction because of those, those weather conditions. Um, I, I do expect that USDA will eventually catch up to what the trade is thinking, but again, it might take them a little bit longer time. So just a brief update on, on the corn situation in particular coming out of South America. Um, the other thing I want to comment on, and then I'll hand it over to Tim Petrie in a couple slides here, is um, when you looked at the USDA uh, chief economist briefing report. So every time before the, the USDA um, uh, releases the information to the public for both the production numbers as well as the WASD report, the supply demand estimates, they have a special briefing for the chief economist to review all the information, summarize it, and they have made those in the last several years, made those briefing reports public. Um, so we get an idea of some of the things that, that not only the chief economist is seeing, but also what some of the forecasters are talking about. And in this last briefing report, they also provided some, I, bit, I guess, a bit more specifics on the assumptions that USDA are making regarding the size and production capacity of Ukraine. And I know that is one of those issues we're really still struggling with on, you know, how big a, a potential reduction are we looking at for 2022 production coming out of Ukraine? So I wanted to briefly review kind of what the current assumption base is within the USDA forecasting uh, models and what they're putting together just for a reference point. So they are estimating when we look at total planted area, looking at about a 30% reduction. That's their current ba base estimate. Now this reduction includes the, the losses in area due to mined fields, um, those fields that are unworkable because of bomb craters or debris, um, fields that cannot be planted due to lack of seed and labor, because that is one of the two of the areas that that are in short supply right now is again, the seed as well as labor to be able to put the crop in. Um, the Ukrainian Ministry of Agriculture has made an estimate that the fuel availability is about 82% of normal. So again, fuel supply is relatively tight, mainly because of the war and the war effort and a lot of the fuel being diverted to the military actions. Now, at least within the current forecast for USDA, they're looking at yield estimates similar to 2020, <coughs> excuse me, so this would be the yield per acre or yield per hectare. So most of right now, the thought process is the reduction in production will primarily come from a, a loss in planted area, not necessarily yet a loss in yield and yield potential. Now, I do expect as we move through 
uh, the rest of the growing season, we get a better idea of weather conditions. Uh, obviously, these estimates will be changing and updated. When we look at projected export levels, now you have to kind of dig through the, the, the information a little bit uh, differently and look at some of the specific tables. I did dig through and say, well, what is USDA forecasting for export amounts, export volumes out of Ukraine when we compare 2021 versus the 2022? Um, and if you look across for wheat, they're looking at a, a estimating right now a bold, about a 47% reduction in export wheat volumes. So they may be able to produce a crop, but are they actually going to be able to get it sold and shipped? Um, so that's a pretty significant cut. The other one that obviously impacted the corn market today is the reduction in corn exports. And again, uh, Argent, um, excuse me, Ukraine is about the fourth largest corn exporter in the globe before the war. Now, obviously, since the war has occurred, that major change in that, they're looking at about a 61% reduction in corn exports, very heavy reduction. Where's that additional corn going to come from is really the open-ended question. Um, I also did some digging and looked at sunflower oil exports because the vegetable oil market right now is really very hot. We're seeing some very large or high global as well as domestic vegetable oil prices. So when we look at the, again, USDA's forecast, they're looking at about a 19, almost 20% reduction in exportable stocks or exportable ability for the uh, sunflower oil. They also prepared some maps. These are really interesting. They prepared some maps where they take an, an overlaid, where's the current military action relative to where the crop is being produced. So they, in each one of these different oblasts or these different regions within uh, Ukraine, they have overlaid where's the current military activity. So the darker the green, that means there's more bushels or volume produced. Um, the lighter hatched areas, especially in these, these northern regions, is where there were conflicts, military conflicts before, but the Russians have retreated versus these heavily thatched or, or cross-hatched areas down here is where there's still active military action. So when we're looking at uh, total planted area, what USDA noticed in the bottom right-hand corner is, that is, is forecasting about 6.84 million hectares. Uh, again, a, a slight reduction in their ability to bo both plant and harvest. The other th interesting thing to, to note is also where are those major or not major, where are the, the, made, the port facilities that can have the ability to be able to load and transit uh, for, for grains? And they're highlighted in these uh, small yellow dots. Okay, so these are not only the major export terminals, but also some of the smaller export terminals. So you get a general idea now of, of overlaying where's the military action on top of where's winter wheat being produced. And again, recognizing this is winter wheat, so it's currently growing. Um, that was planted last fall. This is the same picture, the same bit graphic then for corn production. And notice that the corn production tends to be a little bit further north in the country, especially when we get into those heavily producing areas, those, those areas that have the higher uh, total production volumes. Um, and again, you can see where, where right now the, the challenge is not going to be necessarily the yield portion of it, but it's going to be the planted area. And then the, again, the ability to be able to export those, those crops. Okay, and then my last slide is the same thing for sunflowers. Where are sunflowers planted? Uh, where are they harvested? Where are the major production regions? And you can see that it, it's more in the central portion of, of the country. Um, there are areas that are currently being impacted with the conflict, with active military action. Uh, but there are areas, of course, that are being seeded and, and farmed as normally as possible. So with that, I will stop my presentation. And switch things over and allow Tim to go. So I appreciate your, your, uh, your timeliness and comments and we'll look forward to questions in a minute. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie and EU Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Uh, gonna mainly concentrate on uh, cattle today. Sometimes I do all the others, but a more of a concentration on cattle, particularly for the summer grazing season here. So uh, start off, a lot of times I do start off with fed cattle because the two things that affect feeder cattle the most are fed cattle prices and then corn prices. So I'm going to talk about both of those and what prices are doing. Again, most of you have heard this before. 
uh, but uh, any newcomers just on this chart, spend a little bit more time on the key because all my charts are keyed the same way. I like to put three years on the chart uh, three past years, because if it happened in the last three years, I guess it could happen again and then then put the current year. So uh, the green line is 2019, purple 2020, the lighter, the bluish, lighter blue is 2021, and then always red is 2022. So uh, just looking at the chart, uh, you know, mainly concentrate on the red line, what they're doing this year. And, you know, we've been somewhat stagnant this year, but at quite a bit higher prices than last year. In fact, uh, last week's fed cattle, five area fed cattle prices was the highest price since August, 2015. They're at uh, 143.42. And actually uh, you go down to the blue line, that's $25 higher than last year. And of course, our expectations were for higher prices because we reduced the beef cow herds three straight years. And this year will be the fourth year. And, and uh, USDA is predicting for the first time in a number of years, lower beef production this year, as well as uh, lower pork production as, as well on the, and lamb production on the competing meat side. So uh, lower supplies. Uh, we're uh, positive for prices and that has been occurring, though I know a lot of you, it doesn't seem like uh, prices are high because of all the other issues with particularly with the blizzard and and uh, the corn prices going up and and inflation and all those others but we have seen a nice rebound in in cattle prices the red squares there then are what the futures market is saying for the rest of the year starting with the june futures and usually seasonally cattle do go down into end of June and August when we have that peak slaughter of the previous year's calf crop and then rebound into the end of the year. And so you see the futures are signifying that. Uh, uh, these are yesterday's closing prices and they're off a little bit again today, but uh, for June then we were there at uh, a little bit over 133. And, uh, and you know, the, the futures market there is taking some seasonal risk premium. We could do better than that. We're really watching inflation closely and, and, and gasoline prices and, you know, uh, consumers stop and fill up their tanks with gas and get sticker shock and then go to the store and probably don't feel as much like buying a, a higher priced beef cut as, you know, it's, it's been good for hamburger and it's been good for chicken, but so watching that closely. But anyway, I would be in agreement with that still throughout the year above last year. And then going to next year are the orange squares at the top of the chart there, you know, uh, averaging over 150, which again would bring us up uh, another 10, $12 uh, higher than this year. Again, simply uh, based on uh, lower supplies, lower calf crops and, and, and lower beef supplies and competing meat supplies uh, for that matter. But, uh, uh, you know, again, inflation is a concern and a lot of issues going on there. We're going to start on the feeder cattle side with last week's market report. And then I could talk about this slide for an hour with all the different marketing alternatives there might be and so on, but just going to kind of, kind of give you a quick uh, overview. Uh, again, this is for last week at the three markets at USDA reports. That's uh, Napoleon and Wimpman, Dan and, and Dickinson. And so uh, we had a pretty good movement last week towards the top there under current week, over 4,000 heads sold compared to last year, about 1,200. And, and so, uh, you know, there was talk last fall that all the calves, because of the drought to move in the fall, and we wouldn't have any left by spring, but we've seen uh, quite normal uh, selling receipts throughout 2022. And so uh, calves were backgrounded and, and held over. Start with the steers on the left and then the heifers are on the right, but uh, just go on down. I'm not gonna cover all these numbers and you can come back and see them when, if, if you want to do that, or you can get the market report from the USDA MS website, but start there, the top purple line, you know, I my next chart, I'm gonna show you calf prices average. These are 550 to six weight calves, average 211.78 last week. But again, a wide range in prices there, you see 196 on the low to, to uh, 260. 
17. Uh, that's a $21 range in prices. So, you know, $120 a head uh, difference there. So I do averages, but I realize that wide range, just go under below that. You know, one of the problems now is, is that there are some fleshy cattle coming in and, uh, you know, fleshy cattle get a discount and with eight buck corn, do not get the cattle too fleshy because you get a discount at the market plus you got to have expensive feed so uh, again uh, just a caution there go down to the further down purple one then it uh you know our average on 758 last week at those three markets was just under 159 there but again you've got a 19 dollar range there about 150 dollar ahead a difference there and so you know kind of i tell you that if you're selling cattle obviously you want to be on the top side but if you're buying maybe uh, going down and getting some uh, cheaper ones uh might be something to consider for if you're going to do some summer grazing or something that we'll talk about in a minute and then on the bottom on the steers you see i just picked that to correspond with heifers over there but um you know kind of the top of those 850 to 9 weight steers there the top was about 155 now i'm going to switch over to to the heifer side and um, we do keep and background a lot of heifers and develop replacement heifers in in north dakota in fact uh, on just on january 1st of this year we had the eighth largest number of replacement heifers ever uh, going back to 1920 in spite of the most severe drought since 1988 and so the reason we do that of course is because heifers are severely discounted in the fall and still are now maybe 30 dollars under steers in the fall and by now if you do the right thing and with the heifers you know they'll sell for the top end of steers there and so if you want more on that i have that agriculture by the numbers i think all of you that are on this list serve uh, received our uh, our uh, newsletter that just came out and i have a long column more on that uh, all devoted to heifers there if you want to know more on that so move into the calves that i talked about last time seeing uh, uh you know similar to fed cattle we went above last year at, at the middle of last year and then uh significantly uh higher throughout the year here as we was expect with again the calf crop going down three years and, and less to sell there then seeing a nice spark in calf prices here the last few weeks you know we've got uh, that's mainly due to even though corn is going up it's due to the moisture conditions and summer grazing potential i just talked to uh, uh, a counterpart of mine down in oklahoma on monday and they're still showing up particularly in western oklahoma is being pretty dry but he said they got some nice rain there and that sparked their market down at oklahoma city and thinking they're going to get some green grass so you know uh, uh, you know, prices there again, probably uh, I think about 47, almost $50 higher than last year at this time. Last year in this, at this time on those calves, that blue line, we took a nosedive because it was so dry here. We had hot wind, dry dirt blowing and, and everything else. So that hurt the demand for calves. And then again, I just show you that range there. More importantly, I guess we're looking ahead to fall and what's our expectations there. And again, you know, corn is the big thing. We'll talk about that in a in a minute and, and fed cattle. But right now I'm kind of going, uh, you know, uh, seasonally we do bring them down. The middle October, this last three years there was the worst time to sell calves. Actually four years in a row, I don't have the fourth year in this chart. So seasonally I think we will bring them down, but I'm kind of shooting for that 190 to $2 range in prices now. and. And then we'll have to see what happens with fed cattle and corn as as we go along and maybe refer more to that when we get into the feeder cattle futures chart and so on. So now we're going to kind of switch to corn. <clears throat> Again, we have that opposite relationship between calves and corn, change corn 10 cents and change feeder cattle a dollar in the opposite direction. So in this chart, I have me through yesterday's close, May feeder cattle futures and May corn futures. Uh, both of those are have changed today as Frayne talked about, uh, you know, corn, the last I looked is the fall corn at least is up 
of 13, 14 cents. And the, the nearby, the, this May feeder cattle was down about a dollar and a half, I guess, but the distant feeder cattle now are down another $3 today, just opposite of that corn going. So go back on the bottom there where you see 15. I'd like to go back to February 15th because that's right pre-war and before we saw the, the big run up in corn prices and feeder cattle going down. So on February 15th, May feeder cattle futures were right at 177. That was the expected price for 800 pound steers and we're usually right on that. In fact, a little above that in North Dakota. So we were expecting 177 cattle by now. And, you know, and, and uh, like I, you know, we're, as we'll see in the chart that I show you in a minute, we're down there at about 159. And so, uh, you know, corn was 637 on February 15th, two months ago, feeder cattle about 177. And yesterday feeder cattle had plummeted down to 158.15 and now another buck or so off of that. And <clears throat> corn had went up at the upper left-hand side of the chart in green there was yesterday's uh, closing co uh, May corn at 80. 802 and, and a quarter. So see that opposite relationship? Why are feeder cattle so volatile? Well, because corn is so volatile. So, you know, probably expect that to continue as, as we see how many acres we get in and Ron's going to talk about PP in a minute and so on. And do we get the corn acres in and how do corn prices respond? So we can certainly expect that volatility to continue. Here is the heavier 800 pound steers again, the same story about mid-year. They went above the last couple of years and doing better with the lower supplies and, and haven't had that big rally like we saw in calves on the red line there because feeder cattle are you know these are what's placed into feedlots and the feedlots are dealing with corn and so on and they the the line looks more like fed cattle being kind of just stagnant across there as fed cattle were too and 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 corn going up but again still above last year uh, which is the good news i guess seems like they're not high but the 24 dollars above where they were last year. And then the red squares there are the futures market. And of course, May futures are right there about where the market is now, right there at uh, just under 160. But still, the futures market is saying improvement in these heavyweight cattle by fall uh, and, you know, up to 170 there in uh, in August and up almost to 180 by November, be again quite a bit higher than last year, and and so we'll have to to see. Uh, on the left hand side of the chart, those orange there are next year's futures. Again, we expect everybody's expecting prices to be higher next year with the lower supplies. The rest of those orange lines up there, I changed things up. And if you go down to the bottom right hand on the chart, those are what futures were back on. February 15th, like I just talked about. So there, you know, the May futures again, just back on on February 15th were $19 higher. So we were expecting cattle to be 180 now. And then look at by fall, you know, they're up at 190. And I'm going to talk, just kind of remember that 190 and some of these things, because I'm going to mention it again, you know, they're off $11 now and off another I don't know if they're going to end up three dollars down or not, but uh, today with corn, but you know, there are expectations then has declined with those with those higher uh, corn prices. So, uh, talk a little bit about summer grazing on our website, on my website, the livestock economics website. I have a summer grazing budget. I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but just kind of, uh, you know, highlight them and get, get down to maybe talking about some price risk protection and how much, uh, you know, since we, it looks like we're going to have grass in North Dakota of what the potential might be. Just start off there, of course, pasture outside of the cost of the calf is the biggest thing. And so uh, this is just my estimate. I've had to change this twice here in the last couple of weeks and might have to change it again as as prices are going down but anyway on the right hand side this is an excel spreadsheet so you put your own numbers in here and uh, you know can take it to your lender and and uh, discuss it with uh, the, your lender and so on or do your own budgeting on the right hand side uh, but these are just some estimates that i go by so you know go down to the kind of go down to the bottom there with my estimates, I just brought in a $200 calf and then it, it allows you to uh, just under that purple arrow on the left on K there, it allows you to put in a selling price. 
So I just put in a 173 selling price for uh, September. How I got that is just follow the purple arrow down again. September futures were at 173.17 uh, 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 yesterday. And I, actually, I did this a week ago. So I was under what the futures were then. But I just uh, use that. And, you know, given that price, looks like a hundred and twenty dollar based on my assumptions there and again you have to do your own one uh and then the 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 uh, spreadsheet automatically computes a 10 percent higher selling price and a 10 percent lower selling price for you just to give you that idea and so a 10 percent higher selling price was 190 that's where futures were two months ago so that conceivably if corn all of a sudden fell out of bed or fed cattle increase that would be uh, I suppose possible, but not really probable. Now, the other thing is, if they're 10% lower than our expected selling price, it brings it down to about 155. Follow that area, area over, and that's where they are about now. So they're about that now. In order for them to be up at 73, 173, we're going to have to have higher fed cattle or lower corn or both. So what that tells me is certainly price risk management may be something you can uh, want to consider if you're going to summer graze because we it, at the current market on 800 pound steers, we'd lose about uh, $16 given my budget. So that's just all something for you to, to do your own budgeting and talk to your lender. So talking about price risk management, management just to end up here. I just brought the livestock risk protection insurance over. This came out yesterday afternoon again around 4.30 was good till nine this morning. But uh, on the top, those green circle things are probably the most important things that we, you know the, to discuss here. I, I, if you want more information on LRP, I'd be glad to do it. See your county agent and extension agent, and uh, be happy to provide a, a, a longer version. But you know, yesterday uh, for uh, September 9th, uh, maturity could have locked in the, the you know almost 171. The premium that you would have to pay as a producer is about five dollars so fairly expensive i kind of like to say you know since you're buying insurance here we don't buy insurance hoping to collect we hope the market goes up to 190 like it was uh, just a couple months ago the expectation but uh you know what lrp does is it allows us to put in a floor price but leave the top side open and so when you buy insurance maybe uh in, i suppose the chance of of collecting would be higher at these higher numbers but go back here to the budget and where that arrow is on the left hand side again on based on my assumptions here we had a break even of about 157.69 so if you want to protect that you can go down to the bottom of this chart they USDA lowered their offering prices by all the way to starting 170 and then 177.5 offered it to two dollars less all the way down I skipped a bunch there but I looked at 158.75 you're still a buck above your break even and you've lowered your premium down to a buck 50 but again uh, these are all issues to to for you to to do your own budgeting and to discuss with your lender and so on but you know the market is really volatile and we don't know what uh, corn is going to do and and so on so if you are summer grazing certainly I would at least consider some price risk management so with last Let's go uh, see what Ron has to say if we're going to have any prevent planning and if we're going to be able to get our corn crop in. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Ron Haugen, uh, Farm Management with NDSU. And I'm going to talk about prevent plant. Of course, that's on everybody's mind now with all the rain we're having. And uh, there's a lot of problems out there. Uh, are we going to get more rain? And it kind of appears there's a big blast coming in, in again in the next day uh, or today and, uh, um, and maybe tomorrow. And then it looks actually a little better the next week, cooler, but a little better as far as particip or, uh, participation goes. Um, so I just wanted to show you a few slides here of where we're sitting. Uh, this is these are very hard. You can't really read this, but it's basically in the eastern part of the state. Uh, there's about the 400 to 600 percent of normal precipitation. Um, the actual amounts are about between four to seven inches of rain in some places. Um, so things are really getting wet out there. Um, here's another chart that shows uh, kind of a, in the last 30 days in this area right here, 
um, was uh, actually the wettest area then uh, into Trail County and part of Steele and parts of Grand Forks County. Um, that's actually about 600 percent of normal um, total accumulation. You can see this this dry uh, this uh, wet area here. Out in the western part of the state, things have actually improved as far as a drought goes. So we really don't know what's going to happen there if they're going to get enough to produce a hay crop this year or not. Um, here again, in the last shows in the last 60 days and the last 90 days, and you can kind of see how things have progressed here as far as wetter areas throughout the state. So it's 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 a pretty wide area. Uh, that have that have, are going to have water problems this year, and uh, we're getting late in the year. And the question is, are, uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to get the crop in? Are we going to try uh, get some prevent plant insurance, or or what decisions do we need to make? I wanted to talk about our prevent prevent plant analysis tool. Some of you may have used this before, and uh, it's it was developed to to help uh, producers make a decision on what to do. Uh, it, it just uses partial budgeting um, and uh, it, it kind of helps you decide if it's better to just take it when it gets where it's when it's getting so late is it better to um, take your insurance payment or or is it better to plant a later crop and and have some risks there about getting a crop but probably a lower yield and uh, and then with your with your uh, and it, and basically you enter in your estimated uh, uh, um, information as far as your production, your APH, and uh, coverage levels, and and maintenance costs for the for the uh, PP as well. And here is the website where you can act uh, the link where you can actually find that on the on the NDSU Extension website. And I just took some screenshots here of the. It's an Excel program. I just kind of go through this, uh, uh, and it's very simple. All you need to do is put information in the yellow areas. And everything else is is pretty much uh, calculated for you. Um, you have an option of choosing uh, choosing various crops. So in this example, we just chose uh, spring wheat. We put in an APH of 50 bushels, put in a coverage level of 75, and then of course uh, it's too late now. But if you haven't bought if you had bought up your prevent plant insurance uh, for most crops, it's 60 percent of your uh, coverage level. Uh, and, but you could buy up another uh, five percent for uh, for uh, a little more coverage on your prevent plant. Um, uh, dry beet, uh, uh, corn is uh, and canola are fifty five percent, and you can buy up another five percent. Dry beans are fifty percent, and you can buy up another five percent. And the closing date, of course, was March fifteenth. So if you didn't do that, you're pretty much stuck for what you have. Uh, this program will uh, automatically pull in the. The, uh, the, the spring prices. You can put some information here on, on uh, the cost of maintaining your prevent plant. You're gonna have to keep the weeds down and, uh, and, and uh, there's gonna be some maintenance costs there. Put in your own numbers. The second part of the program here, there again, uh, we picked, going back, we picked wheat here. Um, and this would be, and and the and the the second part, you would act. You could if you think you're going to plant the your wheat very late, then you would pick wheat pick wheat here, or you could probably switch it to another crop. And for this example, we just going to pretend we're switching it to soybeans instead of planting that wheat. We're thinking it's getting too late for wheat. Then we get thir uh, 30, uh, 38 for the APH. What kind of policy is it? A revenue policy. Your coverage level. And then it brings in the in the uh, price. You you have to make some estimates on what the harvest price is going to be, and, and put in whatever numbers you wish. How how many days late it's going to be? What if you're going to have a yield drop or not? Um, and expected market price, and then you, all your various costs associated with that. And based on this partial budgeting, a positive number indicates it's a greater return from 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 uh, you. you collecting insurance and and maintaining that uh, than seeding. A negative number show there, shows there's a loss from prevent plant relative to planting a crop. And so it's all depend, it, when you plug in all your numbers, whether it's positive or negative, that's what it compares. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty easy program to use, but of course with any computer program, garbage in, garbage out, 
you're making a lot of estimates and to come up with an estimate. Um, I want I want to make, mention too then when you pick what crop that you are going to um, uh, collect insurance on, if you do, you do not have to necessarily pick the crop that you were planning to plant there. Uh, the crop insurance rules allow you to pick maybe what, a more valuable crop, but you can't exceed your history. You check with your agent on all the details on those rules. Um, I just, it's a little hard to read this, but uh, we get a lot of questions on this. If you are going to be planting a late crop, um, uh, if I'll just read this to you, the revenue or yield guarantee is reduced each day the crop is planted after the late planting date. Okay, and in this uh, in this software that we have, we have another tab in the Excel program where you can click on and and look up your county and see what the various dates are for the crops uh, in your county. It varies by county. Uh, for example, sunflowers I think are are June fifteenth for almost every county. For wheat, it's it's May thirty first for most counties. Uh, and June 5th for some southern and uh, southern and eastern counties. Um, canola is reduced by one cent, uh, one percent per day uh, for the first five days, and two percent uh, after that. Um, other crops are reduced one percent per day uh, uh, as far as uh, peas and lentils, up to 20 days for sunflowers, 25 days for uh, most other crops. Now, this is what they call the late planting period. You, if if you plant your crop within that late planting period, uh, then your coverage is reduced accordingly. But if you plant after that late planting period, this is something to, to think about, then your coverage gets reduced to your prevent plant coverage, just automatically gets, gets lowered that, that much. There's a couple of notes here I wanted to point out. Um, there there could be a benefit to actually getting a crop in the ground because it might suck out some of the moisture because if you didn't plant a crop or have anything grown there, it's probably going to be just as wet the next year. And also, if you do, uh, do use prevent planting, that does not affect your APH. But if, you, but if you plant a crop and get a low yield, that will be used in your APH calculation. So these are a lot of things that producers are considering at this time. Uh, and we'll have to see how what happens with the weather, and and it, it's tough decisions to make here. But uh, we just wanted to be make you aware of uh, that we have this uh, uh, available for producers to use. Um, this also there also uh, we have a chart and a table based on the information that it spits out of this program. So if you want to find it, instead of giving you the link, I find it easier just to click on our get to our web page, click on Ag Hub click on farm management, go down to the bottom and find it. And as always, keep, keep, uh, keep your crop insurance agent in, informed. Uh, if, you, if you think you're going to have PP, uh, they usually want you to file a probable uh, prevent plant and uh, just keep in touch with your agent at all times. So with that, uh, I will entertain questions at the end and I will turn it over to David. Great. Thanks, Ron. Go ahead and get started here. Uh, Dave Rippling, or Bioenergy Economic Specialist, uh, meeting you this afternoon from the Dickinson Research Extension Center. Uh, just some general comments uh, about what's going on in energy really broadly. Uh, starting first with inflation, uh, with Brian gone, we didn't touch on inflation too much, but the yeah, new numbers were out yesterday for April, uh, down a bit to 8.3% from 8.6% uh, over the year previous. Uh, here in this slide, I show it broken down by major categories, really focusing on the energy uh, category where we've seen a 30% increase in prices uh, it, it, in the last year. And so obviously that has serious ramifications for the economy more broadly, even though in general, you know, we are, the, the economy is doing relatively well. Uh, talked about this uh, the last time I was on a few months ago. Uh, you know, we we are looking at, at very high uh, prices nationally uh, for energy, including gasoline. These are national gasoline prices from AAA uh, in, from today. Uh, it, it's important to note too. We, you know, some of these prices are high, or in, in some places record high. But if you adjust for inflation, we're actually not not even close to the highs that we saw about a decade ago. Um, at the same time, we're not into the driving season. Uh, the summer driving season, and we're going to see that conversion over now 
uh, to those summer blends, uh, as, as well as expected increased demand uh, for passenger travel for gasoline to power those vehicles uh, during the summer driving season. And again, with high income and people coming off of COVID, uh, it's expected that there's going to be significant travel this summer. Uh, kind of going along with all of this too, uh, you know, many of you are familiar with, we've seen about a 50% a increase in the price of used vehicles here uh, since the, the bottom uh, just after COVID struck. Uh, you know, this is uh, expected to persist for quite some time. And really, there's there's a bit of reasoning. Of course, uh, we're, we're behind. Demand is high. You know, we have un, un, unfulfilled, you know, demand kind of carrying over people looking for those vehicles, which are expensive. Uh, you know, we're seeing l little production, a lot of a lot of vehicles uh, sitting in 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 parking lots outside of factories without certain chips or even being uh, sold without chips or production and generally just being slowed down a bit, trying to catch up. Uh, it's important to know too, if you think about when this is gonna be resolved, it's actually gonna take a few years. Uh, and again, this is this is really looking at you know, used cars. You know, one of the biggest sources of used cars is actually from that rental market. And if you think they're short now, uh, they're gonna have to get those vehicles kind of filled up and then it's gonna take a year or so for those to come back out onto the used car market. And so really, we're probably looking at 2024, 25 before things really uh, relax in terms of prices. Although if you do see from the chart, we've actually seen it down uh, from that high in terms of, of, of the price increase uh, from, from the previous year. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about preventive plans. You know, I think back to 2019 and the, especially the corn crop. Uh, this is some, uh, some figures from FarmDoc out of the University of Illinois. Uh, just looking at where we're at uh, from last week, so that week ending May 1st, that, that far left uh, map uh, versus the five-year average and then that difference on the right. And clearly, you know, plantings are, are, are behind, you know, across the board, uh, you know, including here. Uh, and one of the things I looked at is, you know, pulling up that 2019 data. You know, a lot of that crop did get in the ground and, you know, the, 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 the yields, were, were, were not that bad. They were, they were down significantly from 2018 where we had a, a very strong year to, to basically just a bit below trend line. Um, you know, we need to get the, the crop in the ground and growing uh, to, to meet the, the various uh, uses, the demand that, that's sitting there waiting for that, for that new crop. Uh, and here's just a chart kind of showing those, those numbers uh, that, that long-term national corn yield uh, for the United States. Uh, looking really closely at, at, at ethanol, uh, you know, the energy markets in general are very strong. Uh, you know, gasoline prices are high. Uh, gasoline feedstocks, the, the blends ready or the, the material ready for blending and ethanol are, are seeing uh, really high support in some cases, you know, record prices. Uh, if we look at what that means to a, our, our South Dakota corn ethanol refinery, you know, they're, they're making some pretty good money on a per gallon basis, clearly covering all of their costs and doing well. And again, this is really driven by that strong supply, that, that demand pull, uh, you know, prices are very high. And again, this does incorporate for in South Dakota, you know, almost $8 corn, you know, in the spot market, uh, you know, and if we look at production uh, data from uh, USDOE from the Energy Information Administration, you can see that, you know, production is actually, is, is pretty strong, pretty steady. Uh, you know, as we get ready for the driving season, supplies are, are where they are, uh, and we're, we're going to learn a lot as things go forward, and we'll see if if that that demand for for gasoline with ethanol as part of that blend uh, ends up being the stronger issue, or if that price of corn will end up uh, being the primary driver. Uh, piece of news from a couple of weeks ago: uh, the administration, the president, did issue an emergency waiver allowing the sale of E15. Uh, in, in non-containment states. Uh, so that allows them to sell E15, ignoring the, the, the reed vapor pressure issue. Uh, this is nice, uh, you know, it does expand the market, uh, but again, it's, it, 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 it's a very small, uh, uh, very small uh, impact is gonna be expected from this, you know, really to build those, those markets, you need, you know, long-term availability. Uh, and that's, that's not necessarily what this provides. Uh, but it, it does put those products in the market. And actually, if you go back to, to the, the, the previous slide, uh, look at that price of ethanol in South Dakota relative to gasoline wholesale prices, rack prices. You know, it's really selling up, you know, even just a little bit higher than the fuel uh, or the energy uh, 
the, the price of energy based on that, that, that energy density of ethanol. Uh, so it's, it's not necessarily going to be a, a great driver um, uh, of sales. Uh, and of course, in the past, we have seen times where the, the price of ethanol is at a significant discount low enough that its, uh, its value on an energy basis is, is less than that of gasoline. Again, we're not there right now. Uh, another just quick slide talking about vegetable oil. You know, we've experienced a lot of this. Uh, you know, you see, you know, as a farmer, as a lender in agriculture, typically we're working at, at prices. Again, this is, these are soybean prices from CME. Uh, you know, we're looking at 90 cent vegetable oil. Um, that's, you know, by far record high being driven by a number of, of, of factors. Uh, but, you know, I really look at this renewable diesel opportunity uh, as being, again, a major demand pull for that, for that product. Uh, and again, we're really looking at this time and you know, the math is getting closer and closer if we're not there where, you know, really soybeans are, are, are being traded on, on the basis of oil and not protein. Uh, just one last slide uh, question you oftentimes receive, you know, we, we've seen, you know, very high oil prices uh, and not much activity uh, in terms of additional production nationally, including uh, in North Dakota and the Bakken. And, you know, here's a here's a chart uh, from a survey that the, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas does every year uh, asking uh, the folks who are actually in exploration and development, you know, what their, what their break-evens would need to be in for, for new wells or existing wells. Uh, the Bakken used to have its own, uh, its own category, its own color. Now we're rolled into other U.S. shale. Uh, you, you see that that price for other U.S. shale, we just assume that is, it would be the same for all of the Bakken, is $69, substantially less than, than the, the, the price today. Uh, but we're not seeing much activity. And again, it's been driven by a couple of things. Uh, you know, a lot of the low hanging fruit and the, 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 the you know, the, the easier oil to access in the Bakken is, you know, has been, has been drilled, you know, it's been available if, if, if not produced. And now we're really sitting there going, looking at, you know, does it make sense even with high prices to uh, bring additional uh, production online? You know, what, what does that mean in terms of, you know, profitability? Uh, and again, it's just not, it's not causing the amount of, or the, yeah, causing the amount of, activity that we typically expect or, or might have expected. Uh, looking at the far bottom uh, data, I got it from Baker Hughes. Uh, North Dakota rig count right now is 36. Uh, and that was, that was for, for ending last week versus 15 a year ago. So, I mean, the rig counts are still really quite low. Of course, we go back to five or 10 years ago, we're, we're certainly uh, getting a lot more production online for each rig, uh, but you know, not necessarily the amount of activity that we might expect at these prices. Uh, so those were the the comments that I had, and that obviously concludes our our presentation of prepared remarks. Uh, with that, uh, we'll we'll open the floor up to, to question and answer. Uh, and I see that Frain has a question already regarding soybean meal. Yeah, so yeah. I'll, I'll read the question. Um, USDA notes that low soybean meal prices relative to corn are contributing to an increase in soybean meal domestic disappearance. Uh, for marketing year 2022-23, will we see? Will we start to see the soybean meal in diets compared to DDGs? And and Dave, you know, feel free to chime in and comment on this as well. Um, I I guess in this is kind of an opinion piece, but I, in my opinion, I I do think we will see more soybean meal relative to DDGs. Um, now they are not perfect substitutes. Uh, depending upon the species that you're feeding and the specific feed ration. Uh, but in many cases, they are um, somewhat energy substitutes, again, depending upon whether there's full, full oil uh, DDGs or whether the oil has been extracted from it. Um, but again, it, as Dave noted, given the, the strength that we're seeing right now in global oilseed prices, as well as the demand base for renewable diesel um, I do think the profit margins for crushing soybeans are very, very strong right now. Oil is definitely driving the bus at this time, um, which means that we, we will likely have a larger supply of the soybean meal. Now, I, I want to be a little cautious to, to also point out um, DDG prices in a general sense do follow corn prices. So as, as corn prices go higher, DDG prices will also increase because those are, are a little bit closer substitutes. But I guess my, my general consensus is, yes, I do think there will be some switching 
uh, because of the relative prices and relative uh, feed value of the DDG versus soybean meal. So there should be still be a pretty strong demand for the meal. Um, do you think the production estimates for Ukraine are optimistic? Um, my personal bias, yes, I do think they're a bit optimistic. Um, I, I, to be honest, I think the the acreage numbers, their their forecast for acreage, planted acreage, I think will be reasonably close. But you know, to plug in, I know 2020 yield forecasts or yields out of Ukraine were a little bit lower than average. Uh, but I, I I guess I would I would I think that's kind of an optimistic number. In order to get the kind of yields that you normally that you typically would get means that you've got fertilizer applied, that you're being very timely in your field operations for both spraying for weed control and disease control, as well as timely in your harvestability. Um, and, and so I'm not sure that the Ukrainians are going to have um, as, as much flexibility in some of those field operations. Um, the other thing that is also happening that's raising some concerns um, because the old crop export volumes, the, the pace of exports is relatively slow right now, there's still a lot of grain in storage. So a, a lot of their, their, their grains, grain bins are full right now with old crop grain. As the new crop, in particular new crop wheat, starts hitting the market, um, are they going to have enough storage capacity, available storage capacity to handle both the winter wheat crop and then later on the corn crop and some of the minor oil seeds? as they come online. So I do think there's going to be some questions about not only yields and production, but also how much of that is going to be marketable product, how much is going to be actual harvested, uh, will it spoil, are we going to see some more harvest loss? Um, next question, what do you think the winter wheat market will look, look like at harvest compared to spring wheat? Um, <laughs> a very good question. Uh, you know, that price relationship between winter wheat and spring wheat is always something that I try and talk about. Uh, I'll, I'll be very blunt. I, I do think a lot will depend upon the, the kind of spring wheat yields and production we have out of North Dakota. Again, given the wet conditions, we will likely have some prevent plant for spring wheat. We don't know the extent of that yet. There's also some very dry conditions in the Saskatchewan growing regions in Canada. And, and so we can't forget about what's happening north of the border. Um, and, and again, their planted acreage and yield production, uh, yield, yield estimates coming out of there. So right now, in my opinion, it's, it's pretty difficult to try and weed that out. Um, there is kind of a maximum price spread that we tend to see between winter wheat and spring wheat. My current bias, if I were to put a number out there, I do think we'll start to see uh, kind of the, the premiums for spring wheat over winter wheat, at least in the futures market, return back to something that would be a bit normal it's in somewhere between that 70 cent to a dollar range. But again, that's going to be heavily dependent upon what happens later on this year with, with total production. Um, next question, how high can new crop spring wheat go? <laughs> oh man. Um, again, a very loaded question uh, to be very blunt. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it, and, but I do want to caution people as, especially as farm managers and, and, and pe people that are very close to production agriculture, we, we get very wrapped around, uh, our thought process gets very focused on the production numbers and, and understand that as prices go higher, the whole, the whole reason we have higher prices is try and ration use. And so even though supplies may be exceptionally tight, prices start to increase, the real question is how sensitive will the buyers be to those higher prices? Now, domestically, uh, most domestic buyers and best domestic fee, uh, uh, excuse me, wheat mills um, can pay a relatively high price for spring wheat and still make it work uh, as long as winter wheat prices are also high. The real, real kicker for me, I guess the big question mark for me is given these very high prices, what does that mean for the export demand? Um, and there are some of the countries that we export to that are are, are willing to pay the higher prices for spring wheat because they like to have it within their, within their mix. Uh, but again, there's limits to what they can afford to pay. And I do think the export market tends to be much more price sensitive uh, than the domestic market. Um, and so I guess what I'm really looking for as an indicator have prices gone up high enough is are we continuing to make some export sales for spring wheat? Um, when we start to see those export volumes for spring wheat drop off, 
or start to where we start to see international buyers are really hesitant about buying spring wheat. Uh, in my opinion, that's about as high as prices will go. Where that price level is, what that number is, I, I'll be very honest. I still don't know where that what what number to put out there. Um, any advice on locking in prices for 23, 24, et cetera? Um, again, kind of an opinion. Um, you know, there's so much uncertainty right now in, in the grain markets. Um, right now, based on everything we see, I know this is going to be a very loaded answer. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try and express an opinion here. I do think the 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 probability, the odds that we're going to see a major price decrease in the next six months are very, very low. So in my opinion, I wouldn't be terribly anxious quite yet to start pricing 23, 24 crop. Uh, if we start to have more production problems this summer, as we start to see if, if there are additional rallies because of weather problems, at that point, I, I, I would start pricing some, at least some 2023 possibly a small amount of 2024, because we saw something very similar happen in 2012 when we had the drought conditions. Now that the conditions that led that out a little bit different than what we see today, but if we see a price spike or some kind of major major rally in the summer, uh, I guess that's when I would be more, more apt or more, more likely to try and price them from, for the next couple of years forward. Um, uh, info on chemical and fertilizer supplies during planting season. Um, usually Dr. Parman handles that one. I can try and take it if you wish. Just let, letting others have an opportunity. Um, so for fertilizer supplies, uh, I don't think we're going to have major problems with fertilizer supplies. Again, given the fact that we have a late spring, I did talk to uh, one um, a, a fertilizer uh agronomy center. Um, and I asked them about this question about fertilizer specifically. And they said, well, the, the train that they had coming in to restock for uh, mid spring supply chain had, had arrived. And so now they hadn't really hadn't moved any of the, the fertilizer out of the bins yet. So they're scrambling, trying to make room for the train that they had already booked for arrival as, as that restocking fertilizer. So I don't think fertilizer supplies are going to be a major problem at least from the warehousing standpoint, to get it from the dealer onto the fields obviously can be a challenge because of the very compressed uh, planting season we'll have. For chemistry, for chemicals, I haven't heard any major supply chain disruptions on the chemical side. Obviously, supplies are short for certain chemicals, and that's more on the manufacturing side. And we've known about that for quite a while. Um, I know a lot of the, the agronomy centers have already tried to book as, as best they can for chemicals. Um, if there are some, if we have a, a kind of a specialized program where we need, for example, a particular type of fungicide that isn't currently in stock, that could be uh, in short supply. But the indication I'm getting right now is that a lot of the, because we saw some of the chemical supply chain issues showing up, um, people have been doing their best to try and work around that. So uh, again, we'll wait to see, but uh, there might be some chemical supply issues, but I don't see things given what we're looking at today, major fertilizer problems. Okay, so Ron mentioned PP is based on historical production acres. What if a producer rented additional acres this year? Will those acres be eligible for PP based on past producer's history added to the new rent, uh, renter? Okay, I think I know the answer to this, but I, I am probably 80% sure. I, I think if you can get the history of the previous renter, you could use that. But otherwise, I'm not sure. What do you do? You know anything about that, Brain? I I know that there are some rules on that, but it's been a while since I've looked at those. And and so uh, again, without I don't want to mislead anybody. I guess the the recommendation is obviously to talk to your to your uh, crop insurance agent to try and, and track that down. Um, if you do have a trouble finding that, please uh, contact either Ron or myself, and we'll do some more digging and make sure that we can answer the question directly. Um, and then the last one, I think, is for Tim. Yeah. Uh, do you see any other programs coming uh, out for livestock producers to offer assistance with spring storms? As of now, I don't see any new ad hoc that would be, you know, have to go through Congress uh, happening. One thing I will say, we do have the existing livestock indemnity program to pay for losses. And there is 
uh, things in the work that that lightweight calf category is very low compared to the value. And so both FSA and the congressional delegation are working to raise those for those under 250 pound calves. That's in the works. And Frayne, I think there's some chat things for there me. Are. There are. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah. I, I, my, let me see. Okay. So Tim, the first one is, uh, Tim, why are feeders trading at new contract lows? Okay. There's very good, very easy answer for that. Feeders are at contract lows because corn is at contract highs. And as long as corn keeps going up and fed cattle stay the same, feeder cattle are going to go down, keep going down. That's just the way it is because fed cattle are the same feedlots are, you know, uh, looking at that, and and one thing they have control over is uh, is the uh, feeder cattle site. So that's gonna uh, uh, corners contract high and feeder cattle are contract low. That's the story. Okay, so another kind of probably a follow up yeah. question is, yeah. uh, when does Tim see cow herd liquidation ending uh, with corn increasing and live cattle decreasing? Also, the economics of running grass cattle being better uh is is the economics of running grass cattle better than running cattle uh better than running cows excuse me okay well the cow liquidation is is pretty much going to continue on this year even if it would rain all over the u.s we've already slaughtered 17 000, 17 percent more cows and so we're going to go down again this year all depends on rain 60 percent of the beef cow herd is in drought now even though we've improved in in north dakota and so that does not bode well for increasing herd. so we're going to go down this year into next year if we get rain um, rain uh and with the prices that we do expect i think that uh you know, there will be some interest in herd rebuilding, but again, it's a slow process. Uh, you know, we can't manufacture cows. We keep a heifer calf back and breed her the next year. She has a calf the next year and so on and so on. So we're in for lower beef production for the next several years, which will be supportive to prices. And then what about the follow-up for running grass cattle? Is that better or worse than running cows out of pasture? Well, you know, that varies from year to year as well. Yeah, uh, as of now, it looks like running, uh, uh, you know, buying calves, but that'll adjust as we have fewer and fewer calves <laughs> with the lower and lower numbers. That's going to, you know, be like I said, for selling people selling calves, that's going to be very supportive. But that means you're buying uh, higher priced cattle again with the, with the lower supply. So I wouldn't sell the everybody sell the cows with saying i'm just going to run grass cattle but it does offer flexibility if you do have a dual thing there and you have cows and you do a like a heifer development or a grazing then in a dry year uh you don't have to cut back on your cows and you don't have to do that but in a you know if you have plenty of forage then you can add on so that does offer flexibility there Okay, uh, next, uh, it says for Frayne and Ron, uh, what do you think about the administration's interest in support of double cropping? Um, Ron, do you want to try try well, start that? or There's a reason why so, some areas of the country double crop and most areas do not is because it's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily work for most, part, most parts of the country, including us up here. We're lucky if we get one crop in. So, so I don't... I don't know. I don't understand the logic at this point, but well, if I, can, I, I think if someone the, can prove me wrong. Fine. <laughs> I, I think the logic is, is that at least in the short term, you know, to try and provide an incentive to, to plant as many acres and produce as much as possible to try and keep uh, uh, food prices in general down or, or lower, keep them at a minimum, the food inflation. Uh, I, again, I don't know that we're going to see a lot of shift in acreage. I don't know that we're going to look at a big increase. It is something that I think will help, uh, but weather is going to have as, more of an impact than, than the drop, double cropping issue. So I do think it's an attempt to try and be, uh, show that they're being proactive, uh, but at the end of the day, I don't know that it's going to make that much of a difference. Um, and we do have one more uh, question that came in in the Q&A. Any word on the, uh, the WHIP payment? for crop producers from last year. Ron, no, I think no that's word, yours. No, no word yet. A couple months ago, they said they were going to simplify the program and nothing, it's just like in a black hole at this point. So, so we don't know, know anything yet. 
I would assume that if they try to simplify it, it probably won't be that simple. So. All right. So uh, with that, we are a few minutes over our allotted time, but we did want to make sure we got through all of the questions. Uh, again, thank you guys for participating. Uh, we do this once a month, uh, usually the first Thursday after the WASI report, the supply demand estimates come out of, out of USDA. So uh, thank you for, for uh, joining us today. If you do have additional questions, again, don't hesitate to contact us individually. So thank you very much. And I hope you guys have a great day. Mm -hmm.